Karen Yontz, two Olympic gold medals. Roland Mathis, four Olympic gold medals. Cornelia Ender, four Olympic gold medals. Waldemar Cherpinski, double gold medal marathon winner in Montreal and Moscow. In recent Olympic Games, a small new country emerged as a superpower in international sport. This is the story of the German Democratic Republic, the GDR, the men and women athletes of East Germany. summer in East Germany. More than 65,000 young athletes gather in the massive Leipzig Stadium to take part in the Spartakia, a national athletic competition held in the GDR every other year to encourage the best of the country's young athletes on to future international and Olympic competitions. East Germany, whose physical makeup was formulated in 1949 out of territories divided after World War II. East Germany, a country of 17 million people whose size is smaller than Cuba. Throughout the country, there are more than 8,000 well-equipped sports clubs and schools, supervised by nearly 160,000 coaches, trainers, and doctors. The success of East German athletes is often called a sports miracle. In reality, it is the end result of a national effort that makes success in sport a national goal. This philosophy has proven successful. In a little more than a decade, East German men and women athletes have moved to the forefront of international competition. the opening day ceremonies of the 16th Olympiad of the modern Olympic era. Men and women athletes from 67 countries pass in review. Germany will make its second Olympic appearance since the end of World War II. Four years earlier at the Helsinki Games, Germany was represented only by athletes from West Germany. Here in Melbourne, the German team will combine East and West German athletes competing under one flag, bearing the five rings of the Olympic emblem. One of the members of the combined team, 20-year-old boxer Wolfgang Berendt of East Germany. He will compete in the bantamweight division. Berendt, in white shorts, wins all his preliminary and semi-final bouts. 
Now here in the finals, he meets Chun Sun Song of Korea. The bout goes the full three rounds. When it is over, Wolfgang Berendt wins the decision. The victory is historic. It is the first Olympic gold medal won by an athlete from the German Democratic Republic. This is Wolfgang Berendt today. He is a sports photographer working for Neuss Deutschland, East Germany's national newspaper. When I was a child, I had two loves, boxing and playing the violin. I chose boxing and it was a great honor to become the first Olympic gold medal winner for the German Democratic Republic. Today, if I had the same decision to make, it would be a little more difficult. I'm still a member of the Boxing League, but my heart is in music. Rome, 1960. More than 5,000 men and women athletes from 84 countries pass in review. Marching behind the Olympic flag, the combined team from the German Democratic Republic, East Germany, and the German Federal Republic, West Germany. Instead of its own national anthem, Beethoven's Ode to Joy will be played for either East or West Germans who win gold medals here in Rome. The star of the games for East Germany is 17-year-old Ingrid Kramer. She wins gold medals in both the springboard and platform diving events. Four years later in Tokyo, Germany is again represented by a combined team of East and West German athletes. Ingrid Kramer is given the honor of carrying the Olympic flag. Now 21 years old, she will attempt to duplicate the record of America's Pat McCormick, who won successive gold medals in both diving events. In springboard diving, Ingrid Kramer is superb. She wins her third gold medal. But now in the platform diving event, she falters for the first time in her Olympic career. Leslie Bush of the United States defeats her. Ingrid Kramer finishes second. Ingrid Kramer, three gold medals, one silver medal. One of the great performances in Olympic history. May 13, 1978. The town hall in Bitterfeld, East Germany. It is the wedding day of two great Olympic swimmers, Cornelia Ender and Roland Mathis. Cornelia Ender was the outstanding woman swimmer at the 1976 Montreal Olympic Games. Roland Mathis is considered the greatest backstroke champion of all time. Each has won four Olympic gold medals. Mexico City, 1968 the 19th Olympiad of the modern era. A historic event takes place during the opening day ceremonies. For the first time, East Germany will compete as a separate team apart from West Germany. One of the members of the East German team, 17-year-old swimmer Roland Mathis, the world record holder in both the 100-meter and 200-meter backstroke events. I started to swim when I was 10 years old. My brother taught me how to swim. I was an average swimmer. I swam a lot because I liked it. Afterwards, some coaches advised me that I should change from a regular school to a children's sports school. At the sports school, academics and sports were on the same level, 50% academics and 50% sports. It was only at the sports school that I realized I had the potential to swim on an international level. Mexico City, 1968, the final of the 100-meter backstroke. There are eight finalists. 17-year-old Roland Mathis of East Germany is in lane four, fourth from the bottom. Charlie Hickox of the United States is fifth from the bottom. And his teammate Ronnie Mills is beside him in lane six. The three of them are expected to battle it out for the gold medal. As they approach 50 meters, Roland Mathis, the world record holder at the bottom of the screen, is inches ahead. Mathis makes the turn first. Four others are tied for second place. 
Mathis moves farther and farther ahead. Hickox to his left alongside him is second. And Mills of the United States, third. Mathis is a body length in front. Roland Mathis, first. Charlie Hickox, second. Ronnie Mills, third. The time, just three-tenths of a second off Mathis's own world record. A few days later, he wins the 200-meter backstroke for his second gold medal and ends his Mexico City competition by winning a silver medal as a member of the East German 4x100 medley relay team. After the Mexico City Games, Roland Mathis continues to dominate international swimming. His stroke is deceptive. He seems to use no effort, yet he glides through the water at a pace no one can equal. Between Mexico City and the 1972 Munich Games, he is undefeated in backstroke competition. Munich, 1972. 21-year-old Roland Mathis defends both his titles. He wins the 100-meter backstroke, and now here in the 200 meters, with 25 meters to go, he is again in front. Once more, Mathis proves he is the finest in the world. Roland Mathis, the only swimmer in the history of the Olympics to win both backstroke events in successive Olympiads. As Roland Mathis is making swimming history, a new Olympic star is on the rise for East Germany. She is 13-year-old Cornelia Ender, who wins three silver medals. In Munich, I was very young. I went there with expectations to win a medal. I won three medals and I fulfilled my expectations. Of course, four years later in Montreal, it was a greater challenge. I was now the favorite and it is more difficult when you enter as a favorite instead of as an unknown. July 17, 1976. The opening day ceremonies of the Montreal Olympic Games. Two of the members of the East German swimming team, 17-year-old Cornelia Ender and 25-year-old Roland Mathis. Before the swimming competition gets underway, it is announced that Cornelia Ender and Roland Mathis are engaged to be married. Mathis is no longer the number one backstroke swimmer in the world. Roland Mathis, in 1974, is finally defeated by John Neighbor of the United States. Here in Montreal, in his only individual event, Mathis, third from the top, finishes third behind John Neighbor and Peter Rocha of the United States. It is the first defeat for Roland Mathis in Olympic backstroke competition. I knew my competitive career was now over. Age 25 is usually quite old for competitive swimming. I am now studying dentistry. But as often as I can, I will help the young swimmers achieve their goals as I have achieved mine. July 19, 1976. The women's 100 meter freestyle final. Eight women have qualified. Cornelia Ender amazed the swimming world three years earlier, when at 14, she broke Shane Gould's world record for the 100 meters. In the following two years, she broke the record seven more times. With 50 meters to go, Ender makes the turn first. With each stroke, Ender moves farther and farther ahead. Ender leads with 15 meters to go. Cornelia Ender wins and again breaks her own world record. Three days later, Cornelia Ender makes Olympic swimming history. At 7.45 in the evening, she wins the 100 meter butterfly equaling her own world record. 25 minutes later, 
Ender leads in the final lap of the 200 meter freestyle. Cornelia Ender wins her third individual gold medal. Shirley Babishoff second. In all, here in Montreal, Cornelia Ender has won four gold medals. People asked me if I missed the competition. Roland and I have new lives now. Roland is studying dentistry and I'm studying medicine. Our lives are very full. Will our daughter go in for swimming? Perhaps. She will make her own decision when the time comes. Cornelia Ender, Roland Mathis, the greatest swimmers in the history of East Germany. This is the best known crew in Olympic rowing history. They are known as the Dresden Four. Four East Germans who rowed together for eight years in the four man without coxswain event. Their names, Dieter Schubert, Dieter Gran, Frank Ruhl, and Frank Vorberger. They were twice Olympic champions, twice world champions, twice European champions. The number two man in the shell, Frank Ruhl. We were together a long time and have gone through many wonderful days together. My three comrades were 16 years old and I 15 years old when we first met. The fact that two of us had the first names of Frank and two of us were named Dieter was the first of many coincidences. Two of us came from the town of Meissen and two of us from the town of Pirna. They were 60 kilometers from each other, so we decided to meet in Dresden, which was near to both our towns. In reality, we should have been called the Dresden Five. We could not have enjoyed such a great success without our trainer and tactician Hans Eckstein. Mexico City, 1968. The finals of the Coxless Fours rowing competition. The favorite in the race, the Dresden Four, the team from East Germany. There are six finalists. The course is 2,000 meters long, a little more than one mile. The Dresden Four are fourth from the bottom. Alongside them in lane three, Hungary. In lane two, Italy. In the early stages, just a few feet separate East Germany Hungary, Italy. As they approach the finish, the Dresden Four have taken a commanding lead. Hungary is second, and Italy out of the picture, third. East Germany first, Hungary second, Italy third. The victory gave the four of us a beautiful feeling. I think the victory, in a special sense, was a way of thanking all the people who supported us for so many years, who had gone through everything with us. Yes, it was a way of thanking so many people. For the next four years, the Dresden Four continued to dominate their event. Over a six-year period, they were defeated only three times, all three times to crews from East Germany. Never had they been defeated by a foursome from another country. We all knew that the Munich Olympic Games would be our last competition. We had decided beforehand that win or lose, we would not race again. I think there were many reasons why we wanted to win in Munich. Of course, it was to bring further honor to our country. But now, my three comrades were 29 years old and I was 28, considered quite old for an international rowing competition. I think the four of us wanted to prove that older rowers could, if they kept fit, still win an Olympic gold medal. We rowers of East Germany have an expression which is true. Rowing on the Elbe makes you strong. Munich, 1972. The final of the Coxless Fours. The Dresden Fours' main opposition is expected to come from a strong team from New Zealand. Throughout the race, New Zealand at the top right leads East Germany just below them. At 1,400 meters, New Zealand is a boat length in front, but now the Dresden Four increase their pace. They have only 500 meters left in which to catch New Zealand. With each stroke, the distance between the teams narrows. The West Germany team nearest to the camera is third. There are 200 meters left. New Zealand at the top is in the lead. 
East Germany below them second. With 100 meters left, they are even. Now East Germany forges ahead. East Germany first, New Zealand second, West Germany third. Now it was over, but then again, for the four of us, it will never be over. Three of us are now coaches and train young rowers from our country for future competitions. The fourth, Frank Vorberger, is a manager of a transport company. But all four of us still meet once a week and train and relive those wonderful days. And that is why it will never be over. Frank Vorberger, Frank Ruhl, Dieter Grahn, Dieter Schubert. Twice Olympic champions, who for all time will be known as the Dresden Four. This is Karen Jans of East Germany, competing on the uneven parallel bars at the 1968 Mexico City Olympic Games. She won the silver medal in this event, behind the gold medal performance of the incomparable Vera Czeslawska of Czechoslovakia. As a 16-year-old competing in her first Olympic Games, she went on to win a bronze medal as a member of the East German team that came in third for the team championship behind the Soviet Union and Czechoslovakia. Today, she is Dr. Karen Jans, an orthopedic surgeon. I was very young in Mexico City, but the experience was very rewarding. I have been a gymnast practically my entire life. My father, who was a gymnast, taught me when I was a child, and I practiced with him till I was 10 years old when I enrolled in the sports school. After that, it was a combination of sport and study, sport and school. In 1972 in Munich, I was in my first year in medical school when the competition began. In Munich, I knew my strongest competition would come from the gymnasts from the Soviet Union. In the horse vault, Karen Jans is superb. She is now 20 years old. Four years before, in Mexico City, she did not place and finished sixth. Now here in Munich, she wins the gold medal. It is the first time in Olympic history that an East German woman gymnast has won a gold medal. It was a great honor to have been the first woman gymnast for my country to win a gold medal. In the balance beam, I believe I performed very well. My performance was good enough to win the bronze medal. Olga Korbut of the Soviet Union won the gold medal. I looked forward to the uneven bars, which was the event I won the silver medal in, in Mexico City. Olga Corbett of the Soviet Union has become the darling of the crowds. In the uneven bars, she puts on a magnificent performance. But Karen Jans cannot be denied. She is near perfect. When the competition is over, Olga Corbett must settle for the silver medal. Karen Jans has won her second gold medal. In the competition for the individual all-around award, Karen Jans is just barely defeated by Ludmila Turishova of the Soviet Union, but she earns the silver medal, her fifth medal at the 1972 Munich Olympic Games. In all, Karen Jans wins five medals, two gold, two silver, and one bronze medal. My competitive career is of course over, but I will always be involved in sport. My specialty in medicine is orthopedics, and I want to assist the men and women sportsmen of my country to achieve the fullest of their capabilities. Karen Jans, one of the great gymnasts in Olympic history. The pole vault has been in every Olympics since the modern games were revived in Athens in 1896. William Hoyt of the United States cleared 10 feet 9 and 3 quarter inches. Hoyt's gold medal was the beginning of a victory streak that is unprecedented in Olympic history. For the next 16 Olympiads, 
United States pole vaulters won every gold medal. 17 competitions, 17 gold medals. Munich, 1972. Wolfgang Nordwig of East Germany, the bronze medal winner in Mexico City four years earlier, is making another attempt to defeat Bob Segrin of the United States, the 1968 Mexico Olympiad gold medal winner. There is a major controversy here in Munich. A few days before the games, the International Amateur Athletic Federation placed a ban on newly developed fiberglass poles used by Bob Segrin and 14 of the 21 vaulters in the competition. Segrin had to replace his pole with the older model. Wolfgang Nordweg did not have to change his pole throughout all of his previous competitions. For the past two years leading to the Munich Olympic Games, I was the first ranked world in the world. The new poll was available only to certain countries in the world, which is why the International Federation prohibited its use during the Olympic competition. If it had been available to me, it is possible I may have used the new poll and perhaps my results could have been better. With the bar at 17 feet, eight and a half inches, Nordvig and Segrin are the only ones left in the competition. Nordvig cleared the height on his second attempt. Segrin has missed twice. Now his third and final attempt. Now the bar is raised to 5.45 meters, 17 feet 10 and one half inches. Wolfgang Nordvig's first attempt. Bob Segrin again misses on his first two attempts. Now his third and final chance. Segrin misses. Wolfgang Nordvig wins the gold medal. With the competition already won, Nordvig goes on to vault 18 feet, one half inch. A double honor for Wolfgang Nordvig. He becomes the first man in Olympic history to vault 18 feet and the first non-American to win the pole vault gold medal in Olympic history. This is Renata Stescher. Today she is married and the mother of a small child. She competed in two Olympic Games, Munich 1972 and Montreal 1976. In these two Olympiads, she competed in six events and won six medals. The greatest track and field medal winner in the history of East German Olympic competition. I began my athletic career at a sports school when I was a child. It was my own decision. I lived in the small town of Togo and was a member of a factory sports club. In 1966, when I was 16, I competed in my first Sparta Giard, but was not successful. I continued to compete in international competition for the next five years and the year before the 1972 Munich Olympic Games I won both the 100 meter and 200 meter European Championships. I now was prepared for the greatest challenge, the Olympic Games. Munich, 1972. The opening day ceremonies of the 20th Olympiad. Twenty-two-year-old Renata Stescher will compete in three events, the 100 meters, 200 meters, and will anchor the 4 by 100 relay team. September 2nd, 1972, the final of the women's 100 meters. Renata Stescher has won all her preliminary and semi-final heats. She is the heavy favorite to win the gold medal. Her main opposition is expected to come from Raylene Boyle of Australia.
Renata Stescher is third from the right. Raylene Boyle is in lane one on the inside. Renata Stescher first, Raylene Boyle second, Silvia Chivas, Cuba third. Five days later, she will try for a second gold medal in the 200 meters. Her main challenge is expected to come from Irena Zhivinska of Poland, who won this race four years earlier in Mexico City. Irina Shevinska has not only been my model, but she is the model for all athletes. She was an Olympic champion during the years that I had no dreams of such high goals. It is always an honor to compete against her. There are eight finalists. Renata Stescher is second from the left. Alongside her in red shorts, Irena Shevinska. Alongside Shevinska. Raylene Boyle. Coming out of the turn, it is Renata Stescher in the lead. Raylene Boyle second. Irena Zhivinska third. Renata Stescher wins her second gold medal and breaks the Olympic record. Raylene Boyle second. Irena Zhivinska third. I had won two gold medals. Now I had an opportunity to win a third gold medal the next day in the 4x100 relay. Our strongest opponent would be the team from West Germany. My opponent for the last 100 meters would be Heide Rosendahl, who had won the long jump gold medal and finished second in the pentathlon. September 10th, the final of the 4x100 relay. There are eight teams. The West German team, anchored by Heidi Rosendahl, is in lane four in the middle of the track. The East German team, anchored by Renata Stescher, is in lane two, close to the inside. In the heat leading to the final, Stescher defeated Heidi Rosendahl by inches. Now they meet again in the final. Coming up to the final pass-off, West Germany leads East Germany by a few feet. Renata Stescher is in lane two, second from the right. Heidi Rosendahl is in the middle. West Germany first, East Germany second, Cuba third. It was a marvelous race. Heide Rosendahl ran magnificently. I took the baton a few feet behind her, but I was not able to make up the distance. The competition was excellent and it was a great honor to have won a medal, even if it was not a gold medal. Between Munich and Montreal, Renata Stescher continued to compete and win, but not as easily as before. In 1975, she was still rated number one in the world in both the 100 and 200 meters. But in Montreal, she would be challenged by the sprinters of West Germany and from her own East German team. Here in the 100 meter final, she will be opposed by two West Germans, Inge Helton, the world record holder, and Annegret Richter. Inge Helton is on the extreme right in lane one. Stescher is fourth from the right. Annegret Richter is second from the left. Annegret Richter, West Germany first. Renata Stescher, East Germany second. Inga Helton, West Germany third. Three days later, the final of the 200 meters. Renata Stescher, Annegret Richter, and Inga Helton have all made it to the finals. Stescher has won all her qualifying and semi-final heats. The big surprise of the 200 meter final is Renata Stescher's teammate Barbel Eckert, who has also won her qualifying and semi-final heats. However, she has never defeated Renata Stescher. Renata Stescher has the worst lane. She is in lane eight on the far outside. Alongside her in lane seven is Inge Helton of West Germany. Lane five is Annegret Richter of West Germany, the 100 meter gold medal winner. Second from the right in lane two, 
Barbell Eckert of East Germany. Coming out of the turn, Eckert leads. Richter in the middle is second. Stescher closest to the camera third. Barbell Eckert, East Germany first. Annegret Richter, West Germany second. Renata Stescher, East Germany third. It is Renata Stescher's fifth Olympic race. She has now won two gold, two silver, and one bronze medal. My Olympic career was now coming to a close. In three days, I would be in my final competition, the 4x100 relay. Again, our main opposition would be the team from West Germany, who defeated us four years before. In the qualifying heat leading to the final, their team broke the Olympic record. We won our heat, but our time was not as fast. July 31st, 1976. The final of the 4x100 relay. Renata Stescher will run the second leg for East Germany. East Germany is in lane eight. West Germany is in lane one. Stescher takes the first pass off. West Germany is closest to the camera. The East German team in the blue shirts and West Germany are running even, stride for stride. Approaching the final pass off, West Germany leads by a few feet. Now the final 100 meter duel. West Germany is in lane one on the inside. East Germany is closest to the camera. East Germany first. West Germany second. Soviet Union third. The East Germans break the Olympic record. Today, Renata Stescher stands as a symbol for all runners of the German Democratic Republic. Her record of six medals in six events remains as one of the greatest achievements in the history of the Olympic Games. It is July 31st, 1976, the final day of the track and field championships at the Montreal Olympic Games. 67 runners are entered in the marathon. The favorite in the race, Frank Shorter of the United States. Shorter won the marathon four years earlier in Munich. The race starts and finishes inside the stadium. A few kilometers after the start, about one third of the runners break away from the main pack. One of them is number 51, Waldemar Czerpinski of East Germany. I first competed in sports at school when I was seven years old. I liked boxing, but then I turned to running. I used to run the 10,000 meters and the steeple trees, but when I saw Frank Schorter win the marathon at the Munich Olympics, I got interested in the marathon. Czerpinski on the left in the all-white uniform has formulated his plan. He will keep Frank Schorter in sight throughout the entire race. I studied all of Frank Schorter's races and followed his training methods. I knew the only chance to beat him in Montreal was to use his methods. Bill Rogers of the United States leads. Shorter, running behind Jerome Drayton of Canada, has a similar plan to the one that won him the gold medal in Munich. Maintain a fast pace throughout the entire race to get rid of the opposition so that he is all alone during the last stages of the race. Waldemar Czerpinski on the left is not wearing the familiar blue shirt of the East German team and is all but unknown as he runs amongst the great marathoners of the world. Shorter's teammate, Bill Rogers, the winner of the Boston Marathon the year before. Jerome Drayton of Canada, immediately behind Rogers. Lassie Viren of Finland, the winner of the 5,000 and 10,000 meters here at the Montreal Games. Carol Lismont of Belgium, number 61 alongside Viren. Lismont won the silver medal four years before. The race goes on. The front ranks grow thinner. Now well into the race, the man in the all-white uniform, 
is still unknown to Frank Shorter. From the right, it is Chirpinski, Rogers, Shorter, Viren, and Drayton. Shorter's pre-race plan is on schedule. Have as little opposition as possible during the last stage of the race. With the race two-thirds over, there is a major casualty. Bill Rogers of the United States suffers a leg cramp. His chances for victory are now over. The pace has forced Lassie Viren and Carol Lismont to fall back. Frank Shorter has exhausted everyone but Waldemar Czerpinski. Frank Shorter did his job well. It was because of his fast pace that everyone else had to retreat. In effect, he broke open the race. An amusing incident was taking place as we ran side by side. He did not know who I was. No, because I thought he was uh, Carlos Lopez from Portugal, and I knew Lopez didn't speak English. And as it turned out, uh, Pinsky didn't speak English either. Now only two men have a chance for the gold medal, Frank Shorter and Waldemar Czerpinski. While we were running side by side, I was surprised how easy it was for me. I felt very strong. The rain was cooling and gave me an extra incentive. It was like running downhill during the later part of the race. Uh, I realized it wasn't gold medal day when at 21 miles he had about 200 yards. And by 24 miles, I worked that back down to about 20. And then he sort of turned around and saw me and pulled away. That was uh, one critical moment, when he cut down the distance from 200 meters to 20 meters. I knew it was now time to accelerate my speed. The race would be won or lost in his ability to stay with me right here and now. There are just a few kilometers left. Frank Shorter cannot respond to Czerpinski's final surge. Waldemar Czerpinski is again all alone. As I approached the stadium, I heard the playing of our national anthem. It was confusing. I had not yet crossed I learned afterward that they were playing it for our victorious women's relief team. to circle the truck once to the finish line. More than halfway around, I turned to the entrance and saw Frank Shorter come onto the truck. And I only had 200 meters left to run. the final stretch there was one more confusing moment. The lap indicator had the number one on it, which meant there was still one lap to go. I found out afterward that was for the other runners behind me. Nevertheless, I did not want to take a chance. I continued running for one more lap just to make certain. Afterward, people told me they assumed I had taken a victory lap. congratulated me and even so we did not understand each other. I know he wished me well. The victory platform ceremony takes place. Waldemar Czerpinski moves to the top step of the podium. Frank 
Frank Shorter of the United States second, Carol Lismont, Belgium third. Four years later in Moscow, Waldemar Czerpinski makes Olympic history by again winning the marathon. With this victory, he joins Abibi Bikila of Ethiopia as the only two men to win the Olympic marathon twice. The athletes from the German Democratic Republic had incredible success in Montreal. In all, their men and women athletes won 40 gold, 25 silver, and 25 bronze medals, second only to the athletes of the Soviet Union. Their amazing performances have been called a modern athletic miracle. One of East Germany's leading sports journalists. Maybe all over the world are writing about and speaking about the miracle, but there is no miracle. The system that's, uh, that's a word uh, near this miracle. The people couldn't explain something with our sports. They tried to explain as a miracle or as a system. We help everybody in this country who is interesting in sport that he can uh, carry the sport as he will do it. We start in school and we have a lot of small school sport clubs in the whole country. We try to give the best facilities to these school clubs and we know, for example, that there are a lot of schools and there will never an Olympic winner coming from. For example, Roland Mattis, uh, when he was swimming, we had the best backstroke swimmer all over the world. Now, the best backstroke swimmer of, uh, of the world is an uh, American swimmer. We don't do it for Olympic medals or for gold or titles. We do it that a lot of people will uh, learn in young years how important sport is for their life and for their health. So these are the men and women of the German Democratic Republic, a small country of 17 million people whose performances in the international arenas have placed them on an equal level with the athletic powers of the world. The German Democratic Republic, whose philosophy of mass participation in sport has two purposes. For every citizen, the right to be involved in the joy of competition for its elite athlete, the promise of support in the possibility of achieving national and international prominence in sport. This philosophy is shared by the citizens of the German Democratic Republic, a cooperation in sport. Those who are fortunate enough to stand on the highest step of the victory platform at the Olympic Games, and those who share the glory as part of national pride. It is best epitomized by the words of those German Democratic Republic athletes who have achieved greatness in international competition. First, I am happy for my country. Then I am happy for myself.